help me out a little bit. And I'll probably ask uh, Mr. Harder to for some help. So uh, we we'll definitely appreciate that. Um, yeah, can anyone tell me the, the films that you watched? Did anyone have a favorite? Or one that stood out to them that had a theme that maybe they'd like to take into one of some of their own projects? Or just any one that you remember? Yeah. Uh, we watched one, Becky. Becky? Uh, we watched one about walruses. Okay. Or, wait. Yeah, yeah walruses. Walruses. Okay, okay. Uh, cool. Fallout. Right? Fallout? I don't know. No, yeah. 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 Fallout? Okay, yeah. cool. And it just had to do with. Uh, Was it a nature documentary? Yeah. Okay, cool. That's cool. Cool. Yeah, that's so that's like one genre for sure is like the Discovery Channel uh, nature documentary, and that can be really cool. A lot of I have some friends and folks who do a lot of that work around here because we have Yellowstone Park so close. Um, a lot of people go out and spend the entire winter of the year camp in Yellowstone, just tracking the wolves, the lynx. Um, I have a friend out there right now who just has this crazy video that I'll, I'll try to show. That's. Of the, it's not of the bobcat, but there's like the aftermath of this bobcat taking a deer off of a cliff and like flying off, and then there's like the bomb hole of the deer, and the cat is just like sitting there, just kind of like eating the carcass. And they like had it all on film, but it's just little iPhone video of like the aftermath um, that I, I can show you guys um, if you remember. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff with the nature documentary, so that's a great one. Thank you. Um, anything else? Any other ones? Or a different, different theme, maybe? What other, what other ones did you watch? This one you watched. We watched. Just the walrus one. Yeah. The yeah. Whisper. The elephant whisper. Yeah, that yeah. one had a good feel. Like, yeah. I think those are our two sort of nature-y ones. Yeah. yeah. So that fallout one was... We watched Schumacher's Cut Slope. Oh, yeah, Schumacher's Cut Slope. Cut Slope. Oh, yeah. nice. Okay, that's cool. I think yeah. Air Force Capstone or something. That's like a short... That was a short film, right? Yeah. So it was like... Kind of probably more along the lines of what we'll be working on yeah. as a group. Kind of putting together, uh, you know, five. See, that's five even involved. At first, I was like, "Yeah, we could make fifteen to thirty minute ones," and then I'm like, "Wow, that's all, that's like a year's worth of work." Yeah. yeah. So that's I'm like, then when we watch Ethan's, I'm like, "Man, we could do uh, seven minutes. That'd be sick." Yeah. Like, so that's evolved. Um, yeah, I think shorter is def definitely better, especially when you're when you're learning. It's amazing, but you think you're like. This is going to take like 30 minutes, then you have like two minutes, and you spent you know an entire month on a two minute film, and that's awesome. I think that like consolidating all your thoughts is like what film is really great for, and you can put you know so much information into a minute, you know, a couple minute video. Um, that's really really great. Um, did you watch any documentaries that were focused on people with like interviews, and kind of like a talking head type of thing? The goalkeeper one. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, what's that one about? It's like old about like the secret aggressive goalkeeper kind of. Oh. In yeah, the sort of animated. They turn the and they put the story animated. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen that one. Too. That's really cool. The the one that had like was completely interview based was Growing Up Black, mm -hmm. and there was a collection of interviews of some black youth men talking about. How people perceive them. Yeah. You see them walking down the street. Uh -huh. You know. That's um, cool. Yeah. And that was like, all those shots were interviews, so they had to like, kind of tell the story, in six or seven minutes through other people's. Yeah. Perceptions completely interviewed. There's no other. I don't think there are any other shots in that. Those of you who are here. Yeah, editing interviews will also be able to. Has anyone used any editing film editing software before? Yeah, what, which kind? I don't know, right now I'm kind of messing around with After Effects, which I know is a good one, but it's yeah. a thing. Cool. And I've done a little bit in like uh, Premiere Pro. Great, yeah. I use I use all the Adobe stuff, so I think we'll... Uh, do we have, we have Creative Cloud set up, right? Oh, they do, okay, I'm awesome. Just, yeah, so we'll all... I'm just feeble in it, so I hope um, they can become professional in it. If you're, yeah, I think we'll try. Some computers might not be able to handle the, the program, but we'll hopefully they will. And, we'll and those two desktops are available 
Specifically, okay. I got him in here for something like this project. Okay, sweet. Yeah, because we'll we'll break up into groups, and then there might be a great way to kind of think about groups is maybe not just doing it with your friends, but also doing it with someone who's you have maybe one person who's more into the technology of the editing and maybe the filming, and someone else who maybe has a really great idea or a person that they want to interview or tell their story. And I think that's kind of like where we'll start is you kind of think of like people you might know in the community, friends that you'd want to interview and like kind of just tell their story a little bit. And sometimes you don't know what the story will be. You just be like, I think this is an interesting character or a person that I know or that I've heard about that I think like interviewing them would be a really great way to, you know, explore like their history or some, maybe it's not just about them. It could be about Big Sky or about something else. Um, and that can uh, be a fun way to do that. Um, and then basically, if you choose that route, what you'll do is you'll have an interview and then you'll also film, sh shoot something called B-roll. Is anyone familiar with B-roll? Yeah, that's B-roll is like really anything. It can be like basically any, like people doing anything can be Maybe like starting their Maybe example of what you and I did. Yeah, so I'm working on this project right now for Yellowstone Club Community Foundation and uh, your teacher here is one of the um, subjects. And we did an interview with um, five people and then after the interview. So that was like set up in a, like an interview space, kind of indoors, hospital upstairs type yeah. of thing. Yeah, kind of set up, you know, I have, and I can bring in some of my equipment for you guys to check out. You know, I set up lights and microphones, so everyone, you know, you have all the audio. I know we might be a little more primitive and just kind of yeah. using iPhones or unless you guys maybe have, if anyone has a camera they want to bring in and show me, we can talk about maybe using some different equipment. Um, but you know, since we don't have kind of a whole bunch of equipment for everyone, it might be a little hodgepodge putting that together. But yeah, we'll set up an interview and you kind of like put together ahead of time a list of interview questions that will kind of like guide your idea for the project and have to work on ahead of time. And the idea is those questions will kind of create a narrative, right? So you're telling your story. It is fic it's not fiction, but in a lot of ways, putting together a documentary is kind of like putting together a fictional story because you have characters, you have a story arc. It's, it's just very similar to writing, and you find that in editing. Um, editing someone's interview is a lot like writing. You're moving their, their words around, trying to make them sound more concise, and you're also kind of similar to the documentary we watched about growing up black. They like, you know, removed, they only had all these interviews, but they took like the best parts and they put it in an order that kind of created, you know, an arc to the narrative. And we could maybe pull that up or we could watch and kind of dissect that a little bit more. Um, but, but yeah, we did something like that. And then, so the B shots were like, yeah, you know, like what can we get harder doing? That's like, you know, not sitting and reading a book. Yeah. Kind of interesting, but also natural. It's nice. Like if you were to maybe pick one of your friends and they were, you were telling a story about, um, their ski racing career, the B roll could be them waxing their skis, sharpening them, skiing, you know, riding the lift, you know, buckling boots. There's like all these, and you can kind of put together a shot list ahead of time of all the stuff that you might want. So there's a lot, kind of what I'm getting at here is that there's a lot of prep work that would go in to a story and to a documentary. So kind of the first step would be to come up with an, an idea and then just to, from there, to do all these things to kind of be ready to go when you like actually have your maybe hour with this person. Because a lot of times with subjects too, they, it's, their time is very valuable. You know, they're, they're working in the community, they're busy, they're just people. So if they're giving you their time to you, you have to be very grateful for that. And also in that way, not you know, take so much of their time that you have 30 minutes maybe for an interview and you sit down and get everything ready ahead of time and then they show up to wherever it is or you went to them and do the interview and then because you also might need, you know, it's, you got to coordinate with all your friends or all your crew members to be there because everyone's maybe someone's holding a microphone, someone's reading a question, someone's on the camera. So it's just a lot of coordinating. So it's good to get together and kind of put everything into a schedule or a sheet ahead of time so you're ready to go when the time comes. And uh, afterwards, after with that hour, maybe two hours of shooting, you're going to have, you know, many weeks of editing. So I think looking at our schedule for a month, 
um, we'll probably start coming up with some ideas this week and then we kind of will want to solidify them by sometime maybe middle of next week and then the shooting could happen the following week maybe even earlier depending on your ideas and how urgent it might be to get um, kind of like coordinating with everyone just depending on how things things work out but the faster we can get the principal shooting done then the more time you can have on the computers editing and that's really where the creative part comes in and where a lot of the work is is once you're after you've done the shooting and when you're you're editing it's kind of like a like a sandwich or once you have like all your work up front and then the actual like shooting which seems like the most important thing is really only a small piece of time and then there's a lot of work on the on the back end as well um but yeah that's kind of how the structure goes i don't know is anyone interested in filmmaking? Has anyone thought about it before? Or done a little bit of it themselves? Just I know everyone, does anyone on TikTok make videos all the time? Or I feel like you guys are a generation that's very like lucky to have, you have a lot of access to fil films and, vid and video. Um, but this is kind of like almost taking a step a step back and like it's cool you have all that, like, but it's, instead of making a quick video that you are gonna post right away, you might work on it for a month, two months before you share it with anyone, uh, which is kind of a different, a different structure than I think we're used to with the fast Instagram, um, you know, TikTok type of videos we used to seeing all over the place. So, yeah. Does anyone have? It's any crazy questions? that you say these guys have a lot of access. Yeah. <laughs> when you're, you know, six, seven, eight years older than them, but yeah, for I me, it's like, <laughs> you know, the old camcorder running around when those guys were invented. I thought my buddies had him, like with the big tape in it, just like yeah, stu doing stupid things. We were making ninja movies where we would <laughs> stop the film. Like we were like jumping up onto a roof, like really archaic editing that you do with the camera, not even on a platform. Mm -hmm. We'd stop the camera, like you jump up in the air and stop it, and then you'd get someone on the roof jumping up and landing and that would be your shot of me jumping up on the roof with my ninja mask and like fighting the people and the like the enemies and stuff. Yeah, the, the um, in-camera edit. Yeah, like, the in-camera edit so is like, crazy. Yeah, because you'd have a tape and then the tape would be going um, and then you'd have to plan out everything ahead of time because yeah. you'd, you'd use something, here's your little, you'd use something like a storyboard, you know, and you draw out like all of your different this is like, you can kind of, I don't know if there's any, it's kind of like Vine. Anyone have Vine? Is Vine even too old for a villain? It's kind of Vine. <laughs> so that's how, that's how Vine works. Right? So with Vine, you had to shoot, they were like, you'd, you'd press, you had six seconds, but you, you know, you'd hold it down and then it would stop and then you'd put it together that way. So that's like kind of a road back to like the old school camcorders that yeah. you're talking about that have these like, Tape decks in them. I mean, I know my parents' wedding videos on the VHS that went into this giant camera that they just had to like, yeah. you know, they paid someone to come and shoot it. And they, that's just how they did it. They just recorded and then you just got the tape. There's no editing, there's no yeah, nothing. It's just all on the VHS, which is really cool, honestly, that it, it comes out with like very nostalgic. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're talking about. Um, well, B shots, ideas. Uh, yeah. Um, um, let's see. Cool. Well, I guess we'll figure out kind of the timeline, but something to think about now is kind of who your group might be. Do we have, is everyone here now, or are we still missing a few? Yeah, we know. We're just gonna roll. We have about 20 in the class. Yeah. So we'll probably want to do like five groups of four or four groups of five, um, somewhere in there. Um, and kind of what I would like everyone to do is come up, every every one of you will come up with an idea for a documentary. It can be anything. Um, it can be a story, a person that can help you kind of, um, we can talk more about how you might come up with that idea, but I want everyone to come up with an idea. And then what we'll do is we'll all go around, we'll all kind of pitch our ideas, and the ideas are gonna convince people to be in your group, right? You're like, I this is my idea, I think it's really great, this is why it'd be cool, and why you should join me in my endeavor to make this film. And everyone will do that, but we're only gonna have four or five that are gonna be chosen, so we'll kind of narrow it down as a class, um, which ideas kind of stand out, and which ideas maybe you hear someone's idea and you're like, oh, I don't care about my idea anymore, that idea sounds great. And you can kind of like, 
we'll kind of narrow it down from there. But it's, I think it's really cool to have everyone initially try to pitch something and come up with a cool, you know, something that and don't overthink it. Different. It can be just amongst your peers. It's fine. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, you may feel like what embarrassed, um, whatever, shy. I don't know what the silly, indifferent, but that's part of the process. Is like is stretching and tweaking and malleable ideas that are like, yeah, you might start here and end up way over here as, as something completely different, but. Yeah, um, um, in a minute I'll show my thesis document. Is that something you want maybe tomorrow? Well, or is that something like, I, you need like, boom, we, you know. I think happy. maybe Monday of next week might be yeah. a good time to, to do the pitching because I, I don't. See, this has already evolved. Yeah. We came up with something a half an hour ago that we thought would be great for Monday, and now we're already evolving different, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, kind That's of prepared. You can have, if it's helpful to have ideas written out, I think that can be helpful for a lot of people, but kind of on your computer, if you want to print out a couple of bullet points or a paragraph even you want to read, just depending on how I usually will write down a few things and kind of just try to talk through it. I know other people might rather read a pitch, you know, kind of off of the paper, which is also totally fine. It just depends on how, how you learn or how you um, can best. Thinking like, uh, what, like 30 seconds to a minute type of pitch or what? Yeah, I think I think a minute, um, you could, I think a minute, yeah, one minute. Yeah. yeah. Just something like, it's really just trying to get your ideas out there. If you need to talk for a little bit longer, that's fine. But it's just like, hey, I want to interview this person. I think they'd have a cool story about this. Or my friend of mine is doing this cool, uh, ski traverse or cross country ski. They're trying to ski like I don't know um, around the golf course like a hundred like a hundred times. And I want to you know watch them do, you know document them doing that. And there's going to be people coming to you know, watch whatever. It could be an event, a person, um, you know, an athlete, or a teacher, or you know community member, any you know, business owner. You, you could be like, hey, I'm really interested in how. Um, some of you guys already put some ideas on that spreadsheet, right? Or you all were supposed to, but some of you actually did. Thank you. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So you could build on that idea. That might have changed, though. Like, I told you how mine was like, oh, I would do this thing about teaching before the COVID, after the COVID. I'm like, that's stupid. And it's probably been done already, right? Somewhere out there. That's cool. Uh, so my newest idea is what's, what do I want to be when I grow up, even at 50? Mm -hmm. I'm still asking that question. Which leads me to like well, that's first step, and what do I want to be when I grow up? With my Zoom. So, cool. Okay. Cool. Access whatever you need. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I can just I can just get on Vimeo from here. Yeah, yep. I am. You can if you need my account, you just should log okay, in. Okay. Great. Automatically. Sick. I don't even know if we need to log in. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Maybe don't need it. Okay, yeah. okay sweet. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, how's everyone feeling? Does anyone have any ideas or uh, are we excited about this? Is it something yeah. 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 Sure. Cool. Okay. Sweet. Yeah, I think it'll be really fun. Um, yeah, and the documentaries we'll put together will probably be no long, it's like kind of a five to ten minute range is the final video. So we're not going to be putting together anything. So an idea, feel free to pitch anything you want, but just know that kind of smaller, simpler, the better. So if you have a really like lofty idea, that's awesome, but probably what we'll do is we'll try to distill that down and like try to simplify it the best you can, you know. So a lot, I think multiple interviews might be difficult. You might want to kind of focus on one main character. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show uh, this film I worked on where I made pretty much um, myself. I did this for my senior thesis project. It's about wild horses in Northern California. It's an interesting, I found this guy. You know, I kind of was like thinking about ideas that I wanted to do for my senior project. I wanted to do something about wild horses. And then I found this guy online who had all this crazy, whole story about what he's doing to help wild horses and to advocate for them. So 
I went out to California and spent a lot like three, four days with him. I recruited my little brother to help me film. And we were out there and just kind of heard his whole story, did some interviews for B-roll. You know, we went and shot with the horses. We had the drone. We were flying. I don't know if anyone has any equipment like a drone that they're, they're interested in. Cool. So that's, you know, just um, know that that's your resource. And that'll also be a good idea when you're putting your pitch together to talk about the equipment you have or the equipment you want to use. Um, yeah. Cool. So I'll, uh, I'll pull that up and you can watch it. Do you guys know if the, the audio just works or do I need to do anything? Make everything. Uh, make it sure work. That's an experiment. It yeah. should work. Okay. You guys watch. This is how you watch films on this TV yeah. here. Okay. Yes. Cool. There's a little login button in the corner. Login. Where's the Where's the search here? I just want to search. Yeah, maybe we can do. I haven't watched this in a while, so we'll see. the last five years. Well, you know, Mama Girl, how are you? How are you, Mama Girl? What a beautiful man you are. Hi, little bean. Hello, boy. It's all right, Gandalf. We're not here to hurt your baby. Hi, Solomon. It's me. It's all right. They're beautiful. They're wonderful animals. There are American heritage out there. Wild horses are as American as apple pie. We're in trouble. We're losing our forest. This is a serious situation. I'm very conscious of fires around here. We don't smoke outside. If we do any chainsawing, we carry a fire extinguisher with us. When you want to change the heat of a fire, you got a couple things you can do. You can deplete the oxygen, or you can change the amount of fuel. We've had a fire about uh, four miles to the east of us, and then about a mile and a half that way, there was another one. There was a lot of smoke and helicopters, and you can smell them, you can taste it. As you can see, we're all off-grid. There's a large composting toilet, which we call the turret tower. Don't go to town much. I mean, up here, once the fire starts, it's hard to get in here. Up in the I'm afraid of losing everything. Something's got to eat all this grass. You look at this grass here, this is crazy. And that grass turns super iridescent green. I mean, it looks so idyllic. It makes this place look like a garden of Eden. By the end of the summer, you won't see a green thing out here. Everything is going to be brown, dead. The wild horse evolved in North America 55 million years ago. And about 10,000 years ago, which is a geologic winter time, they disappeared. The land still remembered them. And so when they came back with the first Spanish explorers, it's no surprise that, that they flourished. Here is a land that they have lived in for 15 million years. They value their freedom. These horses are part of this environment. They're critical to the maintenance of the environment. And by taking them out of their critical role, we throw the whole system into a turmoil. 
and lots and lots of fuel. And we need lots and lots of horses eating lots and lots of the fuel. It's either going to fuel the horses or it's going to fuel the fires. Either one of the two. A law was passed in 1971 that sought to protect wild horses. It protected the horses and left out what we should do about the wild part. We're stuck in this pattern of gather, round up, and store. We're looking at about 48,000 horses that are being held in BLM corrals. You got all these, these beautiful Native American wild horses in, in cells. They want jobs, they don't want to be in jail. <laughs> And the problem is they've never figured out what to do with it. Where do these horses fit into the bigger picture of the Western ecosystem? I just read the report to Congress from, from uh, March of 2018, basically creating a manageable wild horse and rural program. And on the very first page of it, it has a, a manifestly untrue statement. It says, wild burros and horses have no natural predators. That's not true. That's just a fabricated lie. The BLM is ignoring all science, including its own. The truth is that the mountain lion co-evolved with the modern horse. It knows how to catch the horse. It actually likes to eat the horse. We hadn't seen Elvis in about a week and I was worried about him. And I came around the corner and there was a buzzard on something right up here. And so I went over there and the lion had killed Elvis. And Elvis, well, I don't care if they have a PhD or not, I'll tell them to their face, they're liars. Yeah, she didn't get to live very long. It's harder when you lose them and you got a name and you know them. It's just tougher. could be a way to manage horse herds. The federal government spent decades and great effort trying to eliminate as many predators from the West as possible to protect the ranching industry. You can't manage a natural resource unless you tell the truth. How did we get to this point where we as a society want to protect something wild and free, and so we do something that is captive and expensive? If you're going to protect it, do it right. The BLM is desperate to get horses out of its care. I think if one could demonstrate on huge pieces of land that the horse can be an asset, that the horse is not a liability, then maybe you could get somewhere. These guys are like a fire brigade. These wild horses showed up, they've adopted this tree, they're taking care of this tree. This is a beautiful relationship. More trees like this in the forest means less trees burning. In a wilderness area, you can't use traditional wildfire abatement tools. The vision behind the Natural Wildfire Abatement and Forest Protection Plan, aka Wild Horse Fire Brigade, is to take corralled wild horses, we put them out in these wilderness areas, in a wildfire abatement role, by reducing the fuel in the fire landscape, you reduce both the frequency and the severity of wildfire. And we solve our problem.
Cool. Well, that was a project I worked on for pretty much my, my senior year of college. So definitely a lot of work to put into it. But yeah, um, just wanted to kind of show you guys that and kind of see, you know, that was you know, college work that I kind of put together and tried to tell this guy, Bill, uh, the main character in that, his story, and you know, kind of use some other evidence and kind of put that together. Um, mm -hmm. But you kind of maybe start to see how a narrative is built around an idea. Um, and yeah, I think kind of just take some some of that and put it into your own ideas um, as far as the structure of it, not the actual, you don't have to do anything about horses. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions about either the film or in general about kind of what we're working on, anything about yeah. anything at all? Um, yeah. Do you have a general thought process or like, what's your procedure for choosing how to lay out the shots? Lay out the shots, yeah. yeah. Um, so like in this, do you have a specific example of? Or just kind of the, the patterns that you choose and like yeah. B-roll and actual yeah. information and stuff. Totally, so like with the interviews um, here, there's a moment where he says, you know, like, the grass, the kind of hippie character, Michael mm -hmm. Perez, is like, he's like, the grass looks um, really idyllic. And right at that moment, I decided yeah. to put the greenest fo video I had of grass, mm -hmm. right? Because I shot over a long weekend, but I had to, you know, he's talking about summer, spring. So I'm trying to get shots that kind of match what people are saying. So that's a really oh, nice totally. way to do it. You know, sometimes it can get a little too on the nose and people yeah. kind of be like, okay, that's a little redundant. But a lot of times, you know, there's like ways of kind of doing it where someone says something and you're like, oh, it'd be great if we had a shot of this. And you kind of like, as you're editing the interviews, you can mm -hmm. kind of like start to see the B-roll that you'd love to have. And then you're like, okay, what B-roll do we have? And then you use that B-roll and kind of put it over. Um, you kind of want to work in layers with the interview. So if you had like, um, kind of the baseline of the audio and the interview like uh, video and then on top of it you're going to always want to put cool shots right um, so it kind of just depends um, we'll try to lay out of it, a lot of it ahead of time like I was talking about mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you maybe walked in a little after but I was saying um, you'll do a lot of upfront work with your interview questions and your kind of b-roll shooting plan your shooting schedule and you'll be like this person um, we're going to interview about this and then we're going to plan to shoot them doing stuff and sometimes it's good to like do the interview and then take what you've learned from the interview to plan your your b-roll because sometimes you go into an interview and you're like i want to tell this story and then they start talking about something else and you're like whoa that's way more interesting let's go shoot that and maybe your your plan will change and it's okay to be um willing to adapt and change and not go in with too narrow of a focus um, to be open-minded Yes. Well, like with that going into it, did you have the intention? Because like at the beginning, I was really confused. I was like, oh, like it was all about fires, it was about the horses, or and then it just like had to go perfectly. Like when you're going into it, did you like have that full intention of tying those two together, or were you just going with the like horses? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. So initially, when I was trying to plan out my thesis film idea, I saw David Phillips, the author character, speak at at, at school, and he. Was talking about his new book, the Wild um, Wild Horse Country book, which kind of goes into you know he talks to people all over you know and so like you know, I don't know dozens of different people, different perspectives. Um, Bill wasn't in that book actually. This idea of wild horses and wildfire, I couldn't really find anywhere else. So once it, it kind of popped up when I got connected with um, like Bill's website, I kind of saw that as a really cool, interesting different thing, I started to see it as more of a story and kind of more willing, it made more sense to make a film about. Because sometimes you have an idea, you're like, I want to make a film about wild horses and you don't really know what the story is. You're like, you know, there's the BLM, there's all these different powers that be, but I was like able to kind of focus it on Bill's ranch and what he's been doing for the last, you know, decade there, um, living out there and kind of just, you know, he, as you can tell, he's not necessarily a, uh, scientist by any means, but he kind of likes to feel that way. Um, so it's kind of, I kind of have to do a little push and pull of like, want to show what he's doing, but also I was very careful not to put in any of the things he said that weren't necessarily backed up by um, science or, you know, it's kind of just tried to frame it as that like, these are his 
his ideas or like what he would like to see happen. And you know, his big idea and what his whole organization is trying to do is get wild horses out of the BLM corrals and into areas that need wildfire. Because they know which growing up here, you guys all know wildfires are a part of the summer and sometimes there's smoke and sometimes there's fire and it's a natural part of the ecosystem. And what he's trying to do is avoid those really devastating fires, right? So like we always we know fire is turning into a different type of environment class. But yeah, you know, fire is a I end up learning a lot about this subject. And it's funny because in film you kind of get really into one idea and you kind of become like you know, not really an expert, you just get like put into it. And then once you're done with the project, you're like, oh, I'm gonna move on to something else. <laughs> and just like I have another one to do with all this information I have. Um, but yeah, I didn't necessarily know going into it, but once I decided to go out and um, interview him, I kind of like saw the story coming together. But it took a lot of um, sticky notes on the wall, moving like moving them around, like you know, some of those scenes that were at the end used to be in the beginning and didn't really make a lot of sense. And then we were able to like with our professors and stuff work to put it into a structure where, as you said, you're confused, right? You're like, what's happening? Oh, there's now there's fire, and then it brings together at the end. Um, you know, and this is pretty amateur work still. So <laughs> it's like just something that you know I did in, in college. So it was definitely a learning experience for me and you know kind of Chuck Staff and him go to a couple film festivals with it, which is really fun and it's cool to see meet other filmmakers who are much more experienced than I and it's a fun it's a fun scene to um, kind of a lot of nature documentaries as well. This is kind of a almost like a nature doc, but it's also about humans too. So Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, while you were making this, were there any like times during it where you like learned something new, and then went back and redid something? Um, yeah. So, in a lot of ways, I filmed this kind of in a consolidated period of time. I feel yeah. like I just kind of absorbed a lot of information, mm -hmm. and we just kind of came back with hours and hours and hours of footage. Like I think his interview was, you know, he's a big talker. He talked for like an hour, and I yeah. used two minutes exactly right? um so there's a lot of a lot of things that i like i think learned in going out and actually meeting him and like mm -hmm. kind of seeing you know i can only learn so much talking to him on the phone exactly. so i had you know it's kind of a plan but i kind of just went out like i'm gonna film all this stuff mm -hmm. and then i took that and i pitched my idea that had to be approved by the uh the professors mm -hmm. at cc and the thesis board so they you know, saw it and then you know, I said, you know, I did this work and it, they approved me to, to work on it. Um, but yeah, since I wasn't able to actually go back and like shoot more mm -hmm. because of just the, the nature of the timeline that I had and I had to get it done by. But I think um, I definitely learned talking with the author, David Phillips, a lot about things I didn't necessarily know as far as the history. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to do my best to you know, tell the story in an authentic way. And, um, you know, be kind of let everyone, because you're going to be moving people's words around a little bit and taking like little sections of mm -hmm. different things. And you want to be, the like kind of key in documentary is like, it's okay to change around like how people say stuff, but the idea is you want to stay true to what they mean and what their story is. And you know, that can come from yeah. showing it to them after and being like, not necessarily like they're going to edit it, but just like the approval of like, that's what you were trying to say, not that I'm like, oh, like, I didn't mean that at all. You made it sound like I was on the other side of this argument or something, so staying true to what your characters and subjects, um, what their ideas and stories are is really yeah, important. Yeah. And just in that more of an ethical discussion, but it's always important to stay, stay ethical. Um, and it can be, it's definitely a learning experience, um, always, with, with people about, like, you know, ethics is a really interesting um, thing to get into as well. It's a lot of, like, very similar to journalism, but it's a little, it's a little different because you have a little more creative freedom than you do when you're writing a story for a newspaper or in a magazine or something. Um, so it can get a little nuanced. Yeah. Anyone else? Any, any questions? Yeah. No. 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 I got one more question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, how hours wise? How long did it take you to edit? Um, long time. Months. 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 Yeah. So I did one full. So the, the college I was on the block plan. Um, so we had three and a half weeks. So there was, I had two full blocks 
plus a little bit more of just working on this editing wise. So that was my entire school job was to go in and work on this. And it wasn't just me at the computer. I do professors. I like we do something where you um, transcribe everything from your interviews. That can be helpful. And then print it out and then literally cut out the quotes I like and then rearrange them in order that we like. And you know, there's like a lot of like stuff you can do conceptually off of the computer or away from the technology that can really help you like tell the story. Um, so we can definitely do some of those. Sticky notes can be fun, like kind of create scenes and you're kind of like put together a story arc from an interview can be um, kind of fun. There's lots of different ways to do that, um, but it's kind of nice to sometimes do an analog exercise. I know we all spend a lot of time on our computers, so it can be kind of fun to get away from that for a little exercise and it can help clear your head too. If you get bogged down and like um, but okay, we don't have too much more time left. Um, I don't think we'll have any more assignments. I think I'm going to come back tomorrow. I might be here on Thursday. Um, I don't know yet. So I'm going to talk to the starter about that. Um, but yeah, we'll probably just kind of keep discussing ideas and we can kind of like kind of work in, work in groups or just kind of chat, um, maybe watch a few more. Um, maybe exit some films, some more films um, this week, and then on Monday of next week we'll do the pitches. Um, yeah, anyone have any questions before we're finishing up? Questions, concerns? Any, anyone have any ideas off of that, or should we just save those for in the sense? Oh, we'll save them. We'll save them. Um, okay, cool. Um, sounds good. Are we done at 9.20? Yeah. Okay. 9.22. Okay, cool. Um, sweet. How's the year going, everyone? Enjoying your junior year? Is <laughs> it the best? Yeah. Better than sophomore year? Always. <laughs> well, I'm excited to yeah, meet you guys more and spend some more time with you next uh, month. And yeah, if you ever have any questions or anything, you know, I'll be be here um, just for a little bit, I guess, but um, you can ask Mr. Harder and he'll relay it to me or you know, I'll be back, um, back on Thursday, I think. So, mm -hmm. sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey. Cool. Well, yeah, I'll give you just a few minutes to hang out in the next oh, room. Perfect. What's your next, does everyone have the same next class or does everyone got to go? Sure. 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 Sure.
Yeah. It has a word in it. There's a word in it. Yeah. So you're telling me it was easy. There were echoes in the sky. It was pretty cool. I know, I know. And there was some true balls. I hated it because the way it was it could be true and it could be false. Yes. It's terrible. I haven't heard it yet. It, it was just weird. Yeah, that oh, okay. it was true. Okay. What is it? It's like that. It's harder. So, like, it's on the Now there's no excuses for those of you who don't show up to class. It's all recorded. Oh, thank you, Mr. Oh, my God. Cool. So recorded, I can't even turn it off. Oh, I think it went well. I think it might, um, I think Thursday might make.